when the first crusade was called, mm. uh, back in the 1090s, was it? The original, original one. Yeah. There seemed to have been sort of this sort of scarcely believable groundswell of popular support. Mm. Then when the second crusade was called, I'm thinking of when Eleanor of Aquitaine and uh, the old Louis mm. uh, sort of took the cross at that point. Again, there seems to be quite a large amount of popular support. And even the third crusade, um, even though quite often historians and scholars mention that people were taxed and mm. you were given tax breaks if you took the cross and that sort of helped Sounds popular great. support, <laughs> yeah. still seems to have been hard to deny that there was some sort of popular groundswell of support, the idea that um, Saladin's troops were occupying the Holy Sepulchre. Mm. But this one, Innocent calls a crusade more than once, doesn't he? And the right. first yes, time, as you times. mentioned, they're the first time people are like, oh, it's or ridiculously did. dangerous and probably not going to work. And we only... Didn't the last two fail? Yeah, yeah, right, you know. yeah. The last two failed, especially the second crusade, failed yeah. badly. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I really, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not up for it this time. No. Um, but Innocent III was quite a, a singular figure. Yes. I, I don't know a tremendous amount, I have to confess, about like the history of popes or, you know, any sort of, but I, I know that within history, even, you know, he's quite a, a singular pope. He stands out. Yeah, he does, for Big sure. Big time, yeah. I mean, obviously, much later, it, he's the pope that's responsible for, of course, annulling Magna Carta. Right, you know, yeah, by yeah. the time we get to John and the Barons War, that's still him. He's actually Pope yeah. for quite a long time. And one of the reasons for that is he has in his advantage that he becomes Pope at the age of 37, which is still in full youth and vigour. He's very of, young. Your, your good days, actually. For a Pope, he's yeah, very young. Right. <laughs> quite often a Pope will be a really, really senior Cardinal. And mm. you, you, you're, only, you're only Pope for a few years because you start as a very old man already. Yeah. So yeah, Innocent the Third among the list of medieval, or certainly medieval popes, uh, absolutely stands out. There's a few Gregories, but this Innocent the Third is one of the most pivotal ones. I mean, he institutes a few different orders, and as like I say, his, uh, his papal reign is long. Hmm. Um, and yeah, he's one of those ones that. Um, well, he, how to put it, he's sort of the opposite of a shrinking violet. He wields his power uh, like a weapon. Big time. Um, he doesn't sort of try and particularly try and convince people that they should probably do what's in their spiritual best interest. He's telling people. Subtlety is quite right. overrated for him. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. Uh... Yeah. So he's sort of quite a badass figure. Yeah. Um, and you don't sort of, you don't, you don't mess with him. His will is sort of very, very strong. Mm. Um, but, but as we mentioned, the first time he calls this Fourth Crusade, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of interest. No. Um, <clears throat> but then, <clears throat> pardon me. But then the second, or is, does he even do it a third time? Um, later, a few years later, right, he calls mm. it again, and things have changed. And I suppose we have to get into the story of how, how, how intimately bound up the Venetian state is right. in the Fourth Crusade. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, before I do that, I will just okay. go to, I have this, um, this fantastic book here. I found it at this quaint little bookshop in Canterbury, but it's all first-hand accounts from the Crusades, Fourth Crusade. Um, so I have this one here that's written uh, from Innocent III to um, a gentleman called Fulk of uh, Newley. I'm butchering the French, of course. Uh, but this is him basically giving folk authorization to preach the crusade, to galvanize people. It's quite a... To brother folk, having heard a long time ago a salubrious sample of your doctrine, we were made most happy in the Lord, imploring his mercy to strengthen the good work that he had initiated through you. Moreover, so that you, who are, according to the apostle, engaged in evangelical work, may more fruitfully execute the office of preaching especially for the relief of the province of Jerusalem, which we strive towards with all our might, and so that you may bring back multiplied the talent given you by the Lord, distributing it for the instruction of his people. We follow, we follow the example of him who, indeed, commissioned certain apostles, certain prophets, and yes, other evangelists, so that the sound of their voices might go out into the entire world and their words to the ends of the earth. We grant to you, by apostolic authority, full power with the advice and assent of our beloved son Peter, 
Cardinal Deacon of Santa Maria in Via Latta and Legate of the Apostolic See, whom we have specifically appointed to the execution of this office, to attach to yourself freely as assistants monks, black as well as white, meaning Benedictines and Cistercians, uh, or several canon regulars, whom you have ju uh, judged capable of preaching, and let no one contest this or any appeal stand in the way. According to the words of the prophet, they, along with you, uh, should sow upon the waters, lest the harvest be lost to the people, issued at the Latin of the nonce of November. Wow. Great. I love original text. So that's, that's a voice speaking directly from the late 12th century. It's incredible, it's really, isn't it? It's magical. Yeah. Absolutely magical. <laughs> yeah. And it's really eloquent as well, isn't it? So he's basically saying, uh, don't let anyone say you can't do this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Like, make it happen. Do it and do it. Yeah. With all, it was one thing to note as well, that I think one of the reasons that Innocent reached out to Folk of all people is because they'd actually been acquaintances together at the University of Paris, right. which was, I, I think, the most um, venerable university in Europe at the time. Um, I'm not too sure on that one, but no, that's, is, yeah, that's sure. what I've heard. Yeah. No, so, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the Venetians. Well, just say again, just, right. put, just before we get into that, the Venetians mm. play a massive part in this story, probably one of the biggest. Mm. But of the other Frankish or Western European Christian knightly contingents of this, mm. a lot of them do come from northern France, yes. right? Places like Amiens and Blois and in Flanders, sort of modern Belgium and things, and all sorts of counts and, and knights from there. Yeah. Uh, but they are sort of from all over as well, so I don't want to make people think it's just the Venetians and the French. There are sort of all sorts. Definitely. But a lot of them come from there. Yeah, they do. Um, and the main two, of course, being uh, Theobald of uh, Champagne, right. young, 20 years old, nephew of King Richard, yeah. and, um, and the French king as well, by way of um, Eleanor having one or two marriages. <laughs> so, yeah, he was very well connected in many ways he sort of had a crusading in a, a pedigree you know in his blood from right his, yes you that's know, what they say don't they yeah it's right a per right. perfect choice actually you know 20 vi vibrant full of youth and eager for uh, to go out and do god's work and with him obviously his cousin um the the other count of blue R. I, his name's escaped me right now i think it was might have been a henry but um a louis of course it was Louis, it's in France. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Louis, Count of Blois. And once they um, declared that they were going to go on the crusade at a, a tournament that they were holding in Ecri in the uh, in the Champagne region of France, I think that that was actually the tipping point because the uh, the it's all well and good for the Pope to say, look, I want this crusade, but unless you've got a really charismatic figure to lead it, it's so important with all of this because the, the men have got to have someone that they can believe in who's mm -hmm. going to be there with them to make them go all that way and back again. It's, um, it's an enormous weight of responsibility, of course, to put on someone's shoulders, no less so if you're 20. Yeah, incredible. People seem to have grown up a lot quicker <laughs> back then. Um, yeah, there's a Boniface was one of them, mm. Boniface of Montferrat. Uh, but yeah, there's there's Louis of um, Louis of Blois. There's a Baldwin of Flanders, Theobald Theobald of, of, of Champagne. Mm. So you know the Champagne Flanders Blois region. It's all yeah. right there. Um, they you know they they took it all very seriously. Yeah. Um, Regions ripe for Champagne and Crusaders apparently. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so these contingents have to get to. Jerusalem, in, and in all Crusades, that's sort of half the, uh, more, in fact, way more than half the task yeah. is getting to the walls of Jerusalem. Mm. Actually, besieging and taking Jerusalem seems to be just the final cherry on a giant cake. <laughs> getting there is the hardest thing. You have to either, of course, fight your way all across Europe, through the Balkans, down through Anatolia, and down through the Levant, the Holy Land, all the way down to Jerusalem. Yeah, ask Barbarossa how that went. And the first, right, yeah, and yeah. the first crusade, uh, which is, of course, going to be a saga in and of itself. 
Or as Richard and Louis tried in the Third Crusade, you could sail to like Acre or Jaffa or mm. Haifa or somewhere like that, mm. or Tyre. You could sail right there and then just hit inland to, to Jerusalem. Yeah. But if you're going to choose that route, then you have to deal with and accrue or build an entire navy to do that. Yeah. So which either choice you choose, it's, it's going to be, it's a real ask. It is. And so, they're what they settled on. Well, so the, a, a large contingent of crusaders made their way down to the northern Italian states, as as you said, is sort of um, common practice at this point. That's just traditional uh, crusading practice. But the thing is that Genoa and Pisa, I think, were currently at war with one another. That's right, yeah. And so they were kind of out of the question. So the entire weight of getting ships from anyone fell on Venice. Right. Um, and I suppose at this point it's uh, enter Doge Enrico Tandolo. Right, yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's a great, great figure. Just before we do, just to say then mm. for people that might not know, I suspect a lot of people watching this do know, uh, but for any that don't, um, there's a few sort of great maritime Italian republics mm. or, or city-states rather still and you mentioned Pisa, Genoa, Venice they're the big three really mm. uh, but I, I would say it's really Genoa and Venice are sort of the main two Pisa's no slouch but um, and just because of politics and internal strife and war um, as you mentioned there it's really falls to basically Venice now so Genoa and Venice on other sides of either side of Italy northern mm. Italy um, these are city-states that have got sort of quite incredible shipbuilding programs, right? It's not everyone in Europe that is capable with the best will in the world, even like France or even England. They don't really have the infrastructure to just build 50 ships, 100 ships yeah. quickly. Not at this time. Not at no. this time, because it's yeah. still really early. We're talking the very, very, very late 12th century, the yeah. turn of the 13th century. So it's mm. still really early. You know, the idea of that, that, that England, for example, has got a great navy, not really yet. I mean, it's under John, in fact, that the very, very first, very, very first colonels of sort of a, a royal navy happen. So anyway, this tradition of being able to build quickly and uh, for any sort of price, any price, there's only a few places that can do it. And Venice is one of them. And at this point, it's sort of only Venice. You know, these crusaders, the Western, the, the, the Frankish French crusaders, look around and it's their only real choice is Venice. Yeah, it is. And Venice is controlled by, it, 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 it's a republic, is it, already by this point? I think so, yeah. It, it certainly becomes a republic. But anyway, the leader is the Doge. If anyone doesn't know, that's just the name of their leader. There's sort yeah. of a, the Doge's palace and the Doge of Venice is sort of their their leader and he's less um he's not exactly a king he's sort of a bit more than a king in a way he's sort of a spiritual leader as well and uh, mm. a commercial leader a figurehead anyway there's all sorts of ways you could describe what the doge is and over the centuries the 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 sort of responsibilities the the description the job description of a doge changes over the centuries but at this point it's sort of the dominant absolute ruler really of in in various ways of Venice. And this guy, at this point, is, is a doge of in, doges. Enrico Dandolo. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to tell us a little bit about old Dandolo. Well, I, actually, I, just on the personal note, I'd love to start by just saying that I first discovered this guy, I think when I was actually on a like a caravan holiday in <laughs> Germany or something, right. back when I was just doing some like research for college or something. And I just sat there in my little chat, I think for eight hours, just reading like, <laughs> Uh, I think it was one of Jonathan Phillips' books on the Crusades, but like even then, it was like, wow, this guy yeah. is just like something else. And it's not like he's magnificent and gets everything right. It's just that I think because of the nature of his age, because he was almost 90 by the time that the Crusaders actually came to, to meet him in, in Venice, and he was also blind. Uh, I think rumours during the day were that he'd actually been blinded by a Byzantine emperor, but I don't know how much stock there is to actually put in those. They, they could just be rumour and gossip. Yeah, yeah, not sure. We're not sure quite how he lost his sight. I, uh, the last thing I 
read or was listening to was saying that um, he probably wasn't blinded by the Byzantines, but he may have been. So we talked about how innocent Pope Innocent the Third sort of stands out as a standout figure. You know, in in history, you can't help but have sort of standout figures. Some people are just bigger personalities than others. But this Dandolo, the Doge of Venice, mm. is sort of a scarcely believable figure. He yeah, absolutely, he as soon as you sort of hear about him and what he did and how he behaved and what he achieved and all that sort of thing, it's it's truly truly remarkable. So as you mentioned there, straight away. Is his extreme age. He's in his late 90s, sort of not, not knocking 90 years old, which in the late 12th century, early 13th century, is almost unheard of. Right. It's like someone being 130 years old now. It's like it's right on the absolute, absolute, absolute limit of what is believable. It's like it's not really, it's hardly anyone alive that's that age, if anyone. It's almost math um, almost mathematically far enough back that he could have been born just after the first crusade. Right, yeah. You know, that's how really, like, you know, so all the previous crusades have been in his living memory. Yeah. You know, because there's quite a bit of space, obviously, between the second and third and he's never yeah. been on a crusade obviously personally but uh but he's quite eager for this one and it's not just that he's old and blind it's that he a bit like innocent the third or even more so um is not to be trifled with mm. in any sense yes like he's not a doddering old man no no he's he's got his <laughs> his word his will is is absolute and and well, he strikes me just a very very general overview before we go into some details. But he strikes me as something like um, a, a mafia godfather. Perhaps it's a bit obvious to say something like that. Where uh, if he's saying something, it's it's life and death. It's like you, you're not going to mess with him. If if he's asking for his money, you've got to pay up. You've got to pay up. Yeah. <laughs> If he's telling you yes or no on something, is it that's it? It's yes or no. That's, yeah, that's it. So that's the sort of person he is. Um, again, the absolute opposite of a shrinking fight. The absolute opposite of someone that can be manipulated. So yeah, have yeah. you, you got a quote there? That, well, actually, yeah. So this is from okay. Geoffrey of uh, Villardwin, uh, who was one of the Crusaders, sort of in the main council that made up the Fourth Crusade. So this is his his eyewitness account of meeting the Doge himself. So. The Doge of Venice, a very wise and able man whose name was um, Enrico Dandolo, although he, it's actually in here as the the uh, the Frankish version of that, so they've called him Henry Dandolo, okay. actually, and just a point of trivia, uh, paid the French envoys great honour, and both he and the people of his household gave them a very cordial welcome. When, however, the letters they had with them had been duly delivered, the Venetians were very curious to know what business had brought these envoys to their country, since the documents they had presented were merely letters of credence, stating only that the bearers were to be accredited as if they were the counts in, in uh, as if they were the counts in person, and that they would um, accept whatever arrangements their six emissaries saw fit to make. The Doge, accordingly, said to the envoys, Sirs, I have read your letters, and we fully recognise that your lords are the highest rank in rank of all men, except only kings. They ask us to have confidence in whatever you say, and to believe that they will co confirm any arrangements they made with us. So please speak freely and tell us what you want. My lord, replied the envoys, we beg you most humbly to summon your council so that you may lay our Lord's message before them and let it be called tomorrow, if it be convenient to, to you. The Doge replied that he would need four days to do this and begged them to wait so long until his council could meet. Then they would say what they required. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.